So the next session we have uh, is a session that focuses on something very critical, um, which is compliance. So to explain in a couple of sentences, uh, compliance is a legal framework uh, which companies or organizations must, must adhere to with regard to treatment of their workers and their employees. Uh, given that real estate companies across India who are members of CREDI are medium and small companies, compliance is not given the importance that it requires. So to talk more about this, um, we have a rising star in the field of HR who through their work in the past decade uh, have made themselves noticeable throughout the country. Uh, we have with us Mr. Darshan Balai, the founder and uh, director of Payroll. Payroll is a company which focuses on uh, payroll and compliance. Uh, in a span of 10 years, uh, they have grown, grown wild. Uh, they, have, they cater to more than 300 client companies um, in the verticals of manufacturing, IT, uh, construction, contracting. And uh, their efforts and their work has been recognized through awards on various platforms. Uh, so without a further ado, I would like to hand over uh, proceedings to Mr. Darshan. And we are keen to uh, learn some insights from you about compliance. Thank you so much, Kapil. Uh, it's my pleasure to be on this platform. Uh, first of all, uh, whatever session Mr. Abhishek Kala gave was more like a very insightful, very relevant for me as well. And uh, thank you so much for that insightful points. Uh, secondly, CREDI uh, dignitaries who have taken the initiative, Mr. Abhishek Batevra and all the dignitaries, thank you for having me here. And it's a very good, if I may say, initiative uh, which uh, formalizes HR as a field in uh, real estate. I've been working with CREDI for the last two to three years. And I have uh, uh, very clearly noticed that uh, the, uh, real estate developers, uh, HR and compliances takes a back seat. And that is something that as a developer or as a real estate organization, you are dependent on external agencies. So uh, I am going to shape this session. It's a tentatively whatever uh, 40 to 45 minute session. I'm going to shape it in a myth buster form because uh, what I've observed and what I always uh, notice is that most of the real estate developers or let's say SMEs, mid-size organizations, there's a strong resistance from the top. Uh, pardon me for saying this, but there's a strong resistance from the top. So um, the takeaway from this session would be if you are able to convince even 1% that no labor laws is not a burden or it's not an additional cost center, but it can also be helpful in workforce empowerment then that will uh, be, uh, I, I mean, that will be a major takeaway for me as well on an individual level. Now, uh, let's, uh, uh, let us try to understand uh, the session will be divided into three different parts. Okay. Firstly, I will talk about, if I may say the pain points or the areas where, you know, which is must to do, whether you like it or not. And that is how it is framed. Second part, I will also focus on what could be your, uh, uh, what are the various benefits? What are various schemes? What are various, um, if I may say, available um, legal uh, options which can really be channelized into ensuring that the cost is optimized and in fact, you take it, uh, you in fact, uh, also empower your employees. Uh, we, I'd also try to uh, explain with a present, with an Excel, how pay structure can be packaged where uh, with an objective to have major tax savings and uh, a little bit uh, a word on labor codes as well, as well because labor codes is uh, new let's say new thing uh, on the table and we have to get used to it so uh, we'll start with the common myths so what are the general statements i come across as a consultant as an advisor uh, for any kind of uh, you know organization uh, next slide please yeah. So what are the typical, uh, you know, uh, if I may say misconceptions. Uh, so I have tried to list down a few. There are many such uh, misconceptions and I have to take a lot of efforts to clear out these misconceptions, uh, whoever I come across. And uh, I hope um, this will be taken in the right spirit because the objective should be that the compliances have to be uh, you know attended to they have to be done 
so that uh, we can have uh, you know a complete um, peace of mind so far as compliance is concerned because that is sometimes becomes a headache um so typically what i uh, observe so far as pf is concerned it's not applicable if my sal- salary of my employees above 15000 then there's uh, some misconception about uh, dividing employees into different forms okay this could be very relevant for the audience here uh, into different forms such that none of them cross the threshold as applicable if i include an employee in pf then he becomes permanent with my organization and i cannot terminate him or discontinue him and uh, there's various other misconceptions related to bocw labor license um who is liable to take bocw license who is liable to take labor license what is the responsibility of me as a developer whether it is completely diluted if i engage a contractor or i am still liable then there's also about various different uh, um uh, you know inter departmental data exchange so typical misconception is if i take a labor license for 100 employees or rc for 100 employees for a particular site i have to pay pf for at least 100 employees friends that is not the case so these are like i said common misconceptions and uh, let's try to burst each of them one by one and um, without getting too much technical next slide please uh, let's first talk about pf and esr related misconceptions friends salary above 15000 is not the only criteria in fact as an advisor um i would like to uh make a shift in the outlook that we have as developers or as a, whatever uh, owners or directors of the company that social labor laws as we call it is not any kind of tax it's not any kind of government payment it is a social security scheme when you talk on pf esic mlwf except where there is so when you say when you reword it as social security which the, the government's intention is that means that benefits attached to these payments are indirectly uh, available for your employees so you are in a way uh, taking care of your employees and their interest if you are getting into this compliances so specifically opting out for pf should be an exception it should not become a norm so when i say opting out basic when you say talking about opting out the condition is the employees basic salary should be above 15000 from day 1 there is another condition to be fulfilled that he never should have been pf member earlier so these are two conditions which have to be fulfilled if these conditions are fulfilled you have to document it with form 11 and i have come across inspections where form 11 was not found um duly filled in duly signed and the ex- exclusion was rejected and the dues were levied so the point i'm trying to make is if you're going into exclusion or opting out ensure that all the conditions are fulfilled and documented but on a strategic point of view on an objective point of view make sure preferably treat it as an exception ensure that all employees come under pf gambit beat on the ceiling limit this will ensure parity and uh, social security for your employees uh, clubbing provisions there are specific provisions friends uh, when especially in pf esic even if you divide employees into different different firms but if those firms are functionally integral and employees are interchangeably working for one or the other organization friends then the authorities have passed to club the employees uh, the, and the head count for the clubbed unit or as a group will be considered for applicability so it is not a full proof way of ex- uh, bypassing or uh, you know uh, avoiding the compliances and the applicability so if you are doing this kind of arrangement i would suggest you kindly really look into this arrangement i'll give an example let's say for example uh, we have a, a retail store with multiple um, uh, say cloth retail store with divisions like sari and then ready made uh, clothing if the employees are interchangeably working for one or the other department even if you have different firms within the same premises it will be treated as one common premises next slide please so now okay um also uh, this is the most relevant part of this misconception uh, when i'm saying about contractor so the most common uh, statement i hear is mess up uh, uh, mess up contractor ke employees hai so i'm not liable that is not the case friends government is smart government has already looped the gaps 
and they have made sure that if you are having a contractor arrangement um that does not indemnify you from any of these compliances so they have created some kind of relationship under labor laws uh, which is called principal employer and contractor relationship in this relationship very clearly they have they have uh, put the onus of compliances on the principal employer so as a real estate developer it's very common to have contractors on the site and you might have uh, them uh, engaged labor which could be mobile which could be not permanent but that arrangement once it is established then uh, whether or not you have all documents even having an agreement friends many a times what i observe is many to agreement mein likh liya hai ki contractor is liable no the law supersedes any by party agreement this is a common legal accept legally accepted norm so if law supersedes your ag- agreement then law will uphold and in this case whatever you write on the agreement if the contractor defaults in compliances as a principal employer you can be held liable when i'm talking about pf esic and various other allied labor laws okay uh esic uh, again uh, employee state insurance uh, is uh, uh, an area where uh, awareness is majorly missing but friend uh, fortunately for construction sector with whatever due efforts from various organization uh, being having considering the nature of workforce working on sites construction contractual workers so only workers working on construction sites they are not liable for esic so there is a specific supreme court exemption and a supporting esi notification which allows you not to pay esi for construction workers but let's say there's construction workers and then there's a uh, skilled workforce who is working part in office and site office or head office and if their gross salary is below 21000 they are not exempted so you have to create that bifurcation in your workforce and ensure only by the nature of work if it's construction worker then you can keep him out of esi gambit but if while doing that there is a parallel responsibility on you of their medical coverage that you need to take a policy under workman compensation act and you need to cover him for any personal accident or medical coverage so friends under workman compensation in case of death or dis- next slide death or disablement uh you can be held liable for major financial uh payouts so having an insurance policy with personal accident cover will surely act as a buffer act as a cushion when such payouts uh um, we come across um contract labor act and bocw again this is an area friends where majorly real estate uh, industry gets confused uh, even um, stall veterans who are into this field can don't completely get hang of it which is fairly understandable but i've tried to simplify it with a uh, differentiation so contract as a construction industry at the outset i would say both the laws are applicable parallelly so you don't have any exception Const- contract labor act under that act if the uh, specifically in the state of maharashtra so every state has a different limit none state has known has below 20 limit but in maharashtra if workforce engaged on any day during those 365 days is below 50 then the act itself is not applicable contract labor act so may i have come across various organizations where they ask for tens of registers from the contractors uh, but if it's a small site with when uh, the work uh, contractors headcount or work for count is below 50 you need not comply with this so um that is about workman compensation act uh, very important point security deposit which you pay okay uh, uh, please make note that around 500 per employee we pay in maharashtra in mp it's around 200 rupees per worker so if you take a 100 worker license in maharashtra you are paying 50000 as security deposit to the state government treasury now as per the law this security deposit is fully refundable once the contract is completed so i'm sure uh, many of you in the audience if you taken contract labor license uh, very few of you have even tried to take refund of the deposit and uh, there is a process for it but certainly that can be uh, claimed from the department 
under bocw friends it's applicable on 10 or more workers uh, there is very interesting um, uh, differentiation between contract labor act under bocw there is no such concept as principal employer and contractor so if you are engaging worker through contractor then contractor is held as the principal as the employer so although as a site uh, developer you can be held liable for workers welfare and their health and safety but so far as licensing is concerned as a principal employer unless you have directly engaged site workers no need to take bocw license ensure that all of your contractors take bocw license and when you are ensuring that please make sure that uh, that uh, the license itself has a site address so the license is site specific it is not one license fits all kind of a scenario so kindly ensure that all your construction workers contractors next slide uh, avail uh, take the registration under bocw we generally call it bocw license now these are some facts which would be very beneficial for you this is now let's try to understand what are the takeaways what is something that government is giving back to the organizations who are doing compliance so the underlying thought process when i am delivering this presentation is that we should go in for compliances we should go in for uh, transparency and if you are going it go in with full throttle it should not be like kuch logo ko liya uh, i come across cases where i will give uh, partly on in cash and partly on account so let's try to avoid that if you want to go as an organization they it has long term um, benefits uh, or takeaways uh, if you going for compliance so transparency is foremost uh, first of all objective that you want to do compliance at the top level second is the transparency should be there that it should not be hidden so when you say transparency communication is very important everything has to be communicated communication has to flow from employee to management and to the government okay so communication has to be there and there has to be a democratic decision making scenario where you take the feedback from your various stakeholders including employees consultants department and then frame your compliance objective so now i am focusing on what are various benefits which may not, you may not be aware because when we see compliance chalan bhar diya kaam ho gaya we never think ki what after that so there are various benefits uh, uh, i have already explained point number 1 in the state of maharashtra many very of many of you may not be aware if you have less than 9 employees at a particular site you just have to take intimation it's not even a license so it's a straight forward process of data uploading and getting a receipt that partakes the role of a uh, shop act license um construction contractors i have already explained that uh, esi is not applicable now very inter interesting take away for all of you if your employee is covered under esic and if she is eligible for maternity benefit you might be aware you have to pay 26 weeks of salary to that individual that lady if she is covered under esic for more than 78 days then as an organization you are exempted from paying even 1 rupee to the employee esi will take care of her esi uh, maternity benefit cost in provident fund there is an underlying insurance scheme called edli where a very nominal percentage of your contribution goes and minimum of 2.5 lakhs to maximum of 7 lakhs is the claim which uh, a deceased employee scheme is eligible for in case of unfortunate death of an employee the only condition is she should he or she should have worked for at least 12 months so minimum 12 months of contribution if you see the calculation your pf will not be even 60 70000 rupees max but that keen will be eligible for 2.5 lakh rupees of claim apart from other benefits like pension and pf withdrawal um under eps scheme now why i put this point because very few of us are aware uh under employees pension scheme under provident fund uh, it's uh, you know packaged in the provident fund scheme uh, if employees serves for more than 114 months so nine and a half years she he or she becomes eligible for pension for rest of his or her life after attaining 58 years now after becoming eligible 8.33% is what you are contributing 1.17% government contributes uh central government and you get benefit in tune with 9.5% of contribution so why i am uh, next slide why i am putting up these points because these are some things that we might miss out or we might not put a thought on um 
now these are some more takeaways so as you can see friends so many benefits but which we are not aware so abry scheme provident fund abry scheme is a uh, once in a lifetime scheme central government has allotted 22000 crores and believe me um, both shares of pf government is paying for a working engaging workforce whose basic salary is below 15000 and who are first time pf members so surely it is in a way a net widening initiative by the government but um, once you uh, once that employee comes in pf ambit then he or she becomes eligible for social security scheme but as an employer you have 24 months of subsidy under the scheme that waiver but uh, you need to fulfill certain conditions attached to it there is something called as nats national i am sure many of you may not have heard about this national apprentice promotion scheme it is uh, friends it is a mandatory scheme it's a gazetted scheme by the central government under which you can engage 2.5 to 15% of your workforce if your headcount is above 30 uh, as apprentice as trainees without really uh, without uh, really going in for pf and esi compliances there's a complete exemption along with that there is also subsidy of maximum of 1500 per apprentice per month which employer is eligible if you are engaging uh, apprentice under this scheme um okay so very shortly esic uh, penalty generally there is no waiver for delaying payments of pf and esic but um, there we have uh, fought with esi on multiple occasions and we ensured if there is a back dated coverage by the department then we have managed to take uh, penalty waiver so again major uh, savings because penalty is something that directly goes in government's uh, pockets and there is nothing that uh, you know we can do about it because of the limited uh, you know limited avenues available to employers um mlwf maharashtra labor welfare fund lies with the name is fund again very nominal contribution but the benefits are un, you know disproportionate so i have come across individuals who have paid contribution and have taken benefits much more uh, vis-a-vis what they are contributing so i will not uh, get into the techniques slide please and explain what the benefits are but uh, this major benefits so this covers the part a um, part a of the uh, discussion which is compliances so i can see few questions just at the top whatever uh, so the one about gratuity so why i am saying don't go into lic scheme or uh, i won't say don't go i would say rethink because when you say lic scheme it is bundled it's filled with lots and lots of uh, i won't say lots but compliances you have to create a separate entity and most importantly that fund is irrevocable once you pay the premium to lic then that fund has to be compulsorily utilized for payment of gratuity if in future that amount is not utilized for whatever reason that money cannot flow back into the company so what i'm trying to put across is uh, you lose out your liberty or your control on the funds which otherwise you can keep in liquid form you can have a board resolution you can have actuarial valuation and keep it handy within the organizationals or entities uh, Uh, this um kitty um let's uh, now uh, let's now focus uh, let's now try to understand okay uh we i'll take some questions at the end uh, i have to uh, cover second part as well now one of the briefs for me was taxability so as as real estate developers we tend to have workforce in high tax bracket and we are helpless in terms of how we can package their pay structure to have major tax savings so uh, these are some of the um, areas or these are some of the allowances which you can incorporate in your structure and uh, you can make major tax savings so more than 1 lakh rupees so i have an excel sheet uh, sonam can you uh, open that excel uh, if that is possible for you where i have done the analysis for uh, you know for one of my clients and have observed that if employees in the 30% tax bracket more than 1 lakh rupees can be saved okay specifically i will talk about provident fund 
Mm, okay. Uh, specifically, I'll talk about provident fund in which uh, if you, as an employer, maximum you can pay 12% of basic. So you might say, why I should pay more when there is a limit of 1800. So you can have a repackage the structure in such a way that additional PF contribution, even if it's employer contribution, is recovered from employee. And uh, he will also be uh, uh, you know, at the uh, okay with it because he is getting uh, that entire PF contribution as exempt income. I'm talking about employer share. And when I say that, I, what I am also trying to explain is that um, employee share also has to match up with the employer share. And because it is exempt, not just at the time of deposit, even interest income is exempt. The withdrawal is exempt if you withdraw after five years. And um, the financial benefits attached to providing fund, even if this year the interest rate was reduced, still is much above any other financial instrument, which is government scheme. Okay, um, I uh, I will come to the Excel sheet later on, but uh, let's now let's now try to understand about labor codes because that is something. Next slide, please. That is something that there is lots of speculation about, lots of confusion. As a consultant, if I were to be candid, even I am not fully uh, up with clarity. There's a lot of uh, ambiguity within the course and also with regards to its applicability and how it's going to be implemented. But it is whether uh, today or tomorrow it is going to be a reality. Like uh, I will just simplify what labor course is doing to labor laws. Like GST has consolidated various indirect taxes labor courts they have made an endeavor to consolidate 29 labor laws so there are 29 laws which are applicable on a central level and they have been consolidated into four labor courts and uh, uh, they are not if i may say it's not very revolutionary but it has taken cognizance of some of the pain points of the current industry um, uh, ecosystem Number one, uh, basic should at least be 50% of gross. So if you, you have to revisit your structure, if your basic salary is low vis-a-vis -vis gross salary, especially for low salary employees, then you might be uh, def making a major default once the law is implemented and you uh, April would be a right opportunity for you to repackage your structure, restructure your uh, compensation. Uh, there is also a new introduction called fixed term employment. So organizations can actually hire employees for a fixed period. Now, this is a very interesting um, takeaway for real estate sector uh, because uh, your project, your, uh, your hiring is sometimes project based. So there is always a fluctuation of workforce, major fluctuation, and you can actually hire employees maximum of for a maximum of two years span uh, uh, for a fixed term. So at the end of which the employment will get auto terminated so you're not liable for any uh, you know any exit formalities or any uh, any other payouts but the only condition is you have to pay all statutory compliances even for fixed term employees in fact even gratuity has to be paid now um, gratuity there is a common again misconception or speculation that uh, service period is being reduced that's not the case friend it is going to continue to be five years Otherwise, the purpose of Gratuity Act might get defeated. Um, you will have to issue offer letter, appointment letter mandatorily. This is not mandatory as on date, but they want to formalize employment understanding. So you will have to, whatever be your format, you will have to issue, have it documented. Uh, now, very interesting point is that, uh, which I have observed in labor courts probably is not there in the current framework, that even architects or designers or project engineers can be held liable for any safety of workers at the design level. So if the accident has to happen and if it is observed that there was some design flaw, then even architects or project engineers, although they're not part of uh, mainstream workforce can be held liable. Uh, I was talking about Hawaii uh, LIC, uh, you should rethink. One of the reasons is that under labor courts, they might allow even private insurance players to introduce group gratuity schemes. That's when they'll be more competitively uh, available. And that's when we might, uh, we can uh, give a thought of uh, taking this group gratuity scheme uh, on a, from a private insurer as well. So um, can we, I think that's the last slide. Maybe the next slide, yeah. 
so uh, i am left with the excel sheet so sonam can you open the excel sheet yeah so uh, as you can see can you minimize uh, okay fine uh, so as you can see uh, what i have tried to can you scroll down so further yeah at the bottom yeah so if an employee is thank you if an employee is into 30 can you maximize the last table so if an employee is into 30% tax bracket with the introduction of these these allowances or uh, um, these items into pay structure how much monthly tax you are saving that i have tried to in this year food coupon fuel and maintenance driver allowance the internet and mobile uh, because of the work from home environment but again it is it is uh, filled with conditions so you have to fulfill the conditions and have a paperwork attached to it pf employer sir so this particular case the employee is drawing 5 lakh monthly pay package uh, then uh, uh, tentatively around 5 to 6 i am not considering the transport and outdoor because uh, again it's fairly complicated but if i were to remove this you, in spite of this we have around 6 to 7000 rupees of tax savings per month so uh, annually around 70 to 80000 tax can be saved by incorporating available tax avenues and uh, if i were to you know briefly explain fr frankly not many very uh, options are available so whatever is available we have considered nps i have not considered here if you going for national pension scheme additional tax savings can be done so uh, i i come to the end of the presentation uh, i think we are fairly within time and i can take up few questions i hope whatever was explained i have tried to cover in a brief way not getting very technical but if there's something you want me to elaborate on or explain further i can take it in the form of questions and answers oh uh, thank you so much uh, mr darshan uh, that was a session which was we had a lot of information and i hope uh, you know developers who attended this seminar and our smaller organization were thinking till now ki apna to chhota company hai we did really don't need to look into the csi compliance pf bocw please think again as your number of projects increase as your company grows uh, all this will come up and catch up with you so you know you need to engage with the likes of mr darshan balai and understand what are the payroll and the statutory compliances that you need to adhere to as a company so i think if i take small questions i uh, let me take some small questions i have one is is e nomination mandate for pf claim yes e nomination is uh, okay shall i answer yes please yeah e nomination uh, nomination was always compulsory under provident fund now they have introduced an online nomination process as a result of which in case of death of an employee the claim can be uh, received by the nominee by doing an online application in the 90 if i were to put it 99% of pf related transactions are completely online this from paperless only few areas are remaining one of which is death case so they are trying to uh, digitalize it and in this process e nomination is compulsory and as an organization you have to push all your employees to do this process online thank you uh, another question is is employer liable to pay pf contribution after 58 years of completion yes the employer is liable uh, even if employee completes 58 years there is no exemption the only variation is that you need not pay a pension contribution so the entire 24% will go in provident fund uh, okay uh, which otherwise gets divided into two different funds okay we have another since is the last question i see over here it's a pertinent one uh, maternity benefit payable on total gross or basic wages maternity benefit as per the current law is payable on gross wages now very interesting point because in labor codes they have tried to Uh, redefine the definition of wages so one of the points under labor codes which i missed explaining is that uh, under maternity benefit act if wages are redefined probably your payment might get reduced because now wages is being redefined to 50% of gross or something more whatever is your basic wages so as of now it is on gross wages gross salary okay darshan bhai i want you to bust a myth for us okay it's a big one Uh, we have a uh, labor welfare committee 
okay at the national level at the city level and what this committee has very um, uh, they try to push bocw registrations uh, through which there are various benefits for construction workers now as you mentioned in your presentation that it is the lab, the primary employer in this case is a contractor and it is his uh, responsibility to get that done but we don't our contractors are simply not willing to get the registration done and it is the developers who are now doing the registration so they are taking the onus of it they are doing they are making the expenses and getting the uh, registration uh, done two things on one hand so that the worker gets his benefits they are willing to do the bocw registration but on the other hand they are worried that they will once you know they have done this for 50 100 employees they somewhere worry that they are going to expose themselves to es and pfi authority uh, pf authority which you know yeah. are going to see the disparity so is is this something a developer should be worried about yeah very very uh, you have just touched the pulse or you know the now um for real estate developers uh, friends bocw is an act only for construction sector it is implemented and driven by the state government departments by labor commissioner and when you say license the if you read the license carefully it says maximum workforce on any day over the 365 days period if you are taking license for 50 workers doesn't mean 50 workers are working full time it could be 20 30 whatever okay so number one work head count on license should always be maximum head count doesn't necessarily mean that you are liable to pay for 50 if any departmental authority is trying to push this into you that apne 50 ka license liya hai so you have to pay pf for 50 or anything like that that's not the case number 2 these are two non integral departments only pf and esi departments share information partly not even fully because these are central government authorities bodies under central government control whereas other labor laws are managed by state government so these two departments never ever engage or share the information and in spite of that like i said um when you uh, you were talking about registration of workers and the responsibility and the owners the builder is liable for not directly liable for workers i was saying that contractor has to take license as an employer if you see the worker registration form under bocw the uh, contractor has to sign on it as an employer it's not expecting principal employer to sign but why principal employer has to come into the picture because it is his side he is a, like a mod is like a moderator he has to take the initiative and the only liability of principal employer exposure is that under bocw authorities have powers to uh, extreme powers to issue stay order in case of any accident so eventual um, eventual sufferer victim is the real estate developers that's why he is asked we are well aware of that yeah so uh, hopefully none of us have to go through it but uh, what i'm trying to convey is that if again under bocw also licensing and benefit these are disconnected you might take okay. license for 10 workers and contractors might engage register 12 workers it's fine no one is going to question you okay, okay. so don't get into so much of technicalities government has made different or other things to worry about they will not get into this details so just go ahead and do the registration i think creda has taken rightful initiative in having mid day meal and i have heard very positive feedbacks from various um, different you know uh, stakeholders uh, about this scheme and how it functions it is thank you so much i think uh, that uh, uh, very clearly puts to rest the argument and the doubt in the mind of so many developers that you know uh, when you do bocw registration for your uh, workers at site that information will not be shared with pf and dsi authority okay so please when you know uh, do not shy away from registering your labors under bocw because there are a lot of benefits they get under bocw uh, thank you so much 